Previously on History of Comics, we looked at the golden age of comic books, where superheroes were created and were these infallible titans of justice. After the Comics Code Authority came into power in 1955, we shifted into the silver age of comics, in which superheroes uh, had to find new gimmicks, uh, or especially internal conflict, which made Marvel kind of the king. They like to talk about the Marvel age of comics. Well, DC doesn't. But Marvel definitely touts these 1960s and 70s into their own age of coming into being. We're going to split things into the Silver Age and the Bronze Age, when things are going to take several different turns. The first major turn was Jack Kirby leaving Marvel for DC. Uh, Jack Kirby had been in the comics industry for decades. Uh, since the 1940s, he helped create uh, Captain America with Joe Simon. And he was a lot of the creative force behind Marvel Comics. He helped create Fantastic Four. He helped create the X-Men. He helped create the Incredible Hulk. Uh, Thor. Just people piled on piled came from him. And as with any uh, organization, sometimes the artists don't feel as respected as they should, and their paychecks certainly aren't as high as they should be. DC, looking to get back to the marketplace, decided to offer Kirby a, a deal he just couldn't refuse. And so uh, Kirby left Marvel and went over to... Uh, help out DC in one attempt to retake what Marvel had taken from them. Uh, Kirby, of course, is also famous for his designs. Look at uh, all these black dots. Uh, these are called Kirby dots, also known as uh, Kirby Crackle. So what he would do is show the impressive power within whatever imagery by having these uh, sparkles in the back, just uh, kind of this emanating off of the page through an extra dimension. Well, Kirby came over to DC and developed a whole line of comics called The New Gods, and this was this very celestial story. He was very big into universe building and created a whole system of gods with our headline hero, Orion, and now he's got all this power and he's fighting for good. A uh, pretty cool sci-fi story, uh, which you might say, well, you know, Superman's an alien and that connects, but Superman also is a farm kid from Kansas. So we get those multi-layers of characters. Uh, here with Orion, we get spectacular art. Just look at all that Kirby crackle back there, just showing this power emanating off of his flying machine. But uh, we don't quite have the connection. So New Gods didn't quite work out. Uh, in fact, in Final Crisis a few years ago, they were looking for a superhero to kill off and decided to do Orion. So poor, poor him. So while the heroes may have not worked out, uh, we did get all kinds of villains like Darkseid and somebody who can challenge Superman himself. So the villains did last on, uh, even though DC's gamble with new gods didn't quite work out. Meanwhile, Marvel was looking for new ways to bring in new readers, and as their readers from the early 60s were now growing up and coming into their 20s and even 30s, they needed to come up with something a little bit more mature. So they found a loophole. And uh, what they had been doing is these uh, magazines, much like we talked about Mad Magazine not being under the comics code because it has 51% you know, print, Marvel had been experimenting with things such as Conan the Barbarian, who had recently come into public domain. Very violent tale, we see blood and a guy's head cut off on the cover, which is okay because it's not approved by the comics code, uh, it's strictly for older readers. Well, there is a line in the comics code that you can't do all of this violence, but uh, you can incorporate literary characters. So that's how we had gotten things like the Classics Illustrated doing stories about Frankenstein. Uh, clearly, Frankenstein could not be allowed under the Comics Code Authority, being a reanimated corpse. But it's literature, and so that would work. And they decided, well, Conan's also literature, so we'll soften it up a little bit, and we'll have a Conan the Barbarian comic here in 1970. So here we see Conan, he's uh, fighting all these monsters there in the background, which kind of like Samurai Jack, he can use sharp weapons and, and cut people's heads off, but those are because those are robots. It's not actually blood, it's just oil. So we have Conan fighting monsters, and uh, look at all that Kirby crackle there in the background. Uh, even with Kirby going on to DC, we still have his legacy continuing at Marvel, and now in a new direction with Conan. And the Comics Code Authority approved it because, you know, it's, it's based on these pulp books, so technically it's literature. And with that, uh, Marvel decided to keep going in that direction and see what they could come up with. 
With this pushing and pulling against the Comics Code Authority, um, Marvel published the famous Amazing Spider-Man number 96, which famously does not have the little stamp for the Comics Code Authority approval. So the main plot of this uh, two-parter, 96-97, was uh, Spider-Man uh, solving this mystery where he had been uh, framed for assaulting Robbie Roberts uh, of, of the, working for the newspaper. What really caught readers' eyes was a subplot in which Peter Parker's roommate Harry uh, was going through a lot of the stress of his dad being the Green Goblin, and so he uh, kind of gave himself some more energy with diet pills, uh, which back in the 1950s and 60s and going into the 70s, diet pills were widely manufactured as something to give you energy and burn off weight, uh, which they would since they were essentially methamphetamines. So you'd have lots of energies and uh, clean your whole house, but you would have no idea what you were doing and were very addictive. So by the 70s, the government knew that it needed to do something about it. So uh, the organization that would later become uh, Housing and Urban Development reached out to Marvel Comics saying, hey, uh, we need to talk to the kids about drugs and kids are reading comics. So could you do a comic story about how bad drugs are? And Stan Lee said, that's the best idea I've ever heard. And so he got together with the writers and artists and put together this plot line where Peter Parker and Mary Jane step in and talk to Harry Osborn about, you know, you need to uh, get off this and, and it's ruining your lives and hurting everybody around you. And, and it's a very kind of touching moment. So they did the comic. They sent it over to the Comics Code Authority to get approval. And they, of course, immediately sent it back and said, no, you can't publish this. It has drugs in it. And Stanley called them up and said, hey, the government asked me to do this like this is going to be a really good thing and cca said no we're the comics code authority you obey our authority you do what we say and stanley thought about it and said okay well i i think it's the right thing to do so i'm just gonna publish it and so it went out on racks and it was a big gamble uh, just 14 years earlier we had had ec pretty much get shut down no one would buy the comics with judgment day on them because they didn't have the stamp but when the amazing spider-man number 96 came out no one noticed and in fact, no one noticed until people started reading it and pointing it out. And then the media picked it up and said, hey, this is great. You know, Stan Lee and Marvel Comics, they're uh, stepping out and talking to the kids about drugs. And Stan Lee said, well, we're glad we're making a difference. You know, uh, the Comics Code Authority didn't want us to publish this. So everybody started yelling at the Comics Code Authority, who uh, took a big black eye on this. And they, they were very nervous about trying to do uh, anything they could to... Uh, get their public image back, since really that's all that they existed on. DC, of course, uh, also jumping on this bandwagon, they not only had drugs as a subplot, but here within just a few months, uh, for Green Lantern, Green Arrow, uh, Speedy, the sidekick, is doing heroin right there on the front cover. And the Comics Code Authority is very much approving this, because they do not want to get more bad press about how they are restricting what comics can do. With Marvel once again in the lead, uh, they decided to really push against the Comics Code Authority. They'd gotten away with Conan doing this kind of fantasy adventure, and so they dipped a little bit deeper into literature and pulled in Dracula himself, which the Comics Code specifically bans vampires, but if it's literature, it's Dracula, so that's okay. So what they did is create the Tomb of Dracula, where Dracula kind of has a sequel, continual stories. He wasn't actually killed. And as the story evolves, uh, he becomes a hero instead of this kind of nightmarish vampire character. And so we have a return of horror comics, which we hadn't seen since the 1950s. Getting further into the 1970s, we start having minority superheroes. We had our first African-American superhero with Red Falcon appearing in an issue of Captain America. And then, of course, we had the African superhero Black Panther, also there in the 1960s. But... Early in the 1970s, we had a major change with this Bronze Age of a headline African-American character. So this is Luke Cage, Hero for Hire. If you got a chance to check out the Netflix series, uh, it stuck fairly well to uh, the original comic, a story about a guy who uh, tried to do what he can to make things right for his family in Harlem, uh, gets mixed up with some uh, bad guys, and they try to get him to come pull a robbery with them, and he refuses, so when they ultimately get caught, they blame it on him. He gets taken down to federal prison and locked up in Georgia, where uh, the guard Bubba uh, very racistly just picks on him and beats him up and does horrible things. So to get out of the situation and go back to his family where he can help them, uh, he volunteers for a prison experiment trying to recreate the super soldier serum that created Captain America. 
this is going to be a running theme through Marvel. Uh, we'll see Black Cat getting mixed up on this and all kinds of uh, attempts to keep the Captain America idea going. Um, but of course, every time it has to go wrong, otherwise you'd have 100 Captain Americas and it's just not entertaining anymore. Not special. So Luke Cage volunteers. Uh, he gets the injection and it works, but Bubba uh, notices in on this and uh, messes with the experiment, causes an explosion, kills the doctor who created it, so of course they can't create more. Uh, but Luke Cage ends up saving their lives and proving that he is a good guy. Uh, released early, goes into Harlem and becomes a hero for hire. Uh, he goes and helps out the kids and saves the community center and beats up all the bad guys. So this is the era in Hollywood of black exploitation, which arguably you would say, business-wise, this is where Marvel got the idea for it. But it was also a huge leap forward, because finally we're getting black representation in comics, where previously it had been just white males. Uh, we had a few female characters, such as Wonder Woman, but it's not going to be till later on when we see Ms. Marvel. Then in 1973, Marvel really thumbed its nose at the Comics Code Authority, which... Uh, under that, you're not allowed to show death, and they showed death and permanently killed a character. So, which a lot of jokes in the 1960s and Silver Age, you'd have, you know, the Joker fall off a cliff, and he's presumed dead, but of course he survives, and they'd show a hand to pick up out of the water or something. Uh, Marvel really took a step forward by taking Spider-Man's girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, and having Green Goblin actually kill her. So we get a little bit of background of uh, Gwen and Peter Parker wanting to be together, and of course Spider-Man uh, gets between them, right? He has this survivor guilt from Uncle Ben's death that he's got to do what he can. With great power comes great responsibility, and he has superpowers, so he, he has to do something about it. And here we get one of the most famous pages in all of comics. Gwen Stacy pushed off the top of the bridge, Spider-Man saying, I've got to catch her, stop her before she hits the water. Uh, manages to catch her leg. She falls, uh, but of course we finally get uh, an examination of physics in comics. So previously uh, somebody like Lois Lane would fall off the top of the Daily Planet building and Superman would swoop in and save her just you know feet before she hits the sidewalk. But she still fell 70 stories and would have a lot of momentum built up. So really what would happen is he would catch her and uh, she would be torn apart in his arms. But, of course, comics creators would say, well, between the panels, what, which, what showed is that he slowed her down. And so, so what you can do in comics, get that closure going. But here, uh, we see her fall, and Spider-Man manages to stop her, but you can see this little snap down at the bottom where uh, she has whiplash, and, and her head kind of lulls on a broken neck as he's pulling her up. And this is very dark for a comic, and really drives Spider-Man crazy as well as the the fans. So this is getting into really deep literature and, and examining what do you do when someone is truly evil to the point of killing people for fun. So Spider-Man goes nuts, and uh, much as we saw in some of the 90s and 2000s Spider-Men uh, beating up Green Goblin, saying some of the worst words Peter Parker can think of, worm-eating, uh, and of course, uh, ultimately, proves himself as a hero because he's not going to kill him, he's not going to lower himself to that level, and instead uh, walks away, which Angry Goblin tries to kill Spider-Man with his flying platform, uh, which, which thanks to the spider sense, Peter Parker jumps out of the way and Green Goblin destroys himself. Very powerful storyline. The Comics Code Authority uh, had to approve it because they weren't going to uh, get another black eye from the media for what they were, were trying to do with drugs before. And Marvel made it stick. Uh, it is tradition in Marvel, all of their comics, that Gwen Stacy has died. She can't be brought back. Uh, they have uh, done a couple of different things with that, such as uh, having a clone of her at one point. Um, and, of course, we have Spider-Gwen. So Gwen Stacy from an alternate timeline where Peter Parker was the one who had died, and she gained the superpowers. With comics getting darker and fans really eating that up, uh, we get one of the darkest characters out there, Wolverine. Uh, often touted as the first ever Canadian superhero, although Captain Canuck had been created as an indie superhero just a couple of years before. Uh, but we'll talk about indie comics later. 
Wolverine's the first mainstream Canadian superhero, and uh, he's got this healing factor and animal senses, and we get this situation where Hulk, uh, with Bruce Banner finally leaving the United States and, and going into Canada where the U.S. military can't follow him, uh, now, of course, he's got to face the Canadian military, headed up by this secret agent, Wolverine. And Incredible Hulk's the unstoppable force, right? If he, if he can't smash it, it makes him mad, and when he's mad, he gets strong, so he gets stronger and keeps smashing. Uh, Wolverine can't be stopped because he has healing factor and, and uh, an immovable object. So Wolverine proved to be an increasingly dark character. So we've got a character who, with this healing factor, uh, has been alive for countless decades. Uh, it wasn't until just recently that they determined when he was actually born in his origin story. And if you're unkillable, going into war is a pretty good professional choice. Uh, unfortunately, fighting in every single war really adds up on your PTSD. And so we get a very broken character. Uh, he drinks and smokes. Uh, he's constantly trying to take away the pain. Uh, he has a very rough romantic life. Either his girlfriends die or try to kill him. And it's not easy being Wolverine. Uh, at points, he would be considered an anti-hero, but for the most part, he's just a tough guy, blue collar, doing what he has to do to get by. And people find that very interesting. Uh, it shows how dark we can get with these comics and still make them very enjoyable. Later in the 1970s, we'll have Miss Marvel come in. So we talked about Captain Marvel in the Golden Age, uh, this Fawcett character who uh, was a bit of a copy of Superman, uh, who would later be taken over by DC. And then we had Captain Marvel from Marvel Comics, uh, Marvel, in the Silver Age. And in the Bronze Age, we changed it up and brought in Ms. Marvel, so who is more recognizable from the Captain Marvel movies of today. And a new burst of attention with a new Wonder Woman, which is going to give us uh, Marvel trying to catch up with their own female superhero. As the 1970s turn into the 80s, uh, Marvel's once again kind of running out of steam. They're finding these darker heroes interesting, uh, so they decide, well, let's take the mutants, those X-Men, and turn them into new mutants. So we'll get a new batch of heroes, which, of course, everybody knows Cyclops and Jane Grey and Beast. Uh, but not so many people remember the new mutants with uh, Wolfsbane and Cannonball and Darkstar and... Uh, it just didn't quite work out. Uh, the X-Men worked perfectly as this metaphor for civil rights and this question of what can we do. But from the 1980s, uh, it more mirrored mall culture. So these teens coming up, what, what does it mean to be a Gen X kid? And it didn't quite give the same internal and external conflict. And so it didn't pan out, but it did give us Cable, so who's very much a dark character, this uh, assassin from the future who's coming back. And this gave us some good internal and external conflict, uh, since he is a warrior, but he's put in charge of these kids. And so we get this uh, weird agglomeration of growing up as a teenager, but also in the middle of a uh, culture war. And finally, we gain some traction with interest, uh, although it's all about Cable, not really about Wolfsbane. I think she's cool. Over on the DC side, they're still treading water after the Kirby gamble didn't quite work out. So... In the late 1970s, they begin what's called the British Invasion. Uh, they see all these great comics that are going on in the United Kingdom and bring over some of the writers and artists, including Alan Moore, which we'll talk about a lot when we get to the Dark Age. So Alan Moore was invited to uh, rewrite the Swamp Thing. Uh, he was this old story from the 50s, uh, a character that needed to be renewed so that they could keep the copyright and so Alan Moore gave him a new perspective and uh, tied in ideas of environmentalism that were becoming very popular in the 1980s, uh, that we need to care for our planet, otherwise the planet's going to act out against us. As well as a case of vengeance. So this character needed to... <clears throat> and tracking down those who had killed him before. The popularity of Swamp Thing... Uh, kind of turned heads at DC. They really hadn't been focusing too much on the characters themselves, and so they decided that the story is what we need to renovate. So in the mid-1980s, we get Crisis on Infinite Earths. And up until this point, uh, DC had kind of said, you know, whatever needs to happen in the comic can happen. And that's where we had, you know, Batman in the 1940s using guns and uh, pumping people off buildings uh, versus the 19... 
60s Batman where he you know, touted drinking milk and making sure you got plenty of sunlight every day. So a very different character. And what DC would always say is, oh, well, these are you know different universes. It's a multiverse theory, uh, which goes all the way back to The Flash in the 1950s. Uh, where the Flash from Silver Age ran so fast that he accidentally slipped into the Flash's era uh, from the Golden Age and go out and save people and talk about what it means to be a hero and good things like that. So DC decides to finally get its ducks in a row, and they decide they're going to crash all the universes together and come up with a an actual timeline, so the true DC. And this is how we would explain Superman sometimes having powers and sometimes not. And we're finally going to get those all ironed out into the super strength and laser eyes and things that we're familiar with. But of course, no teleportation as he had at one point in the 70s. Marvel, meanwhile, didn't have so much success with its new creations in the 1980s. So they decided, well, let's bring back our old guys and just have everybody fight everybody. And we got the Secret Wars line. Very popular as all the heroes are pulled off of Earth with all the villains put on Battle World and trying to see who can win, good versus evil. Kind of gimmicky, uh, but it worked very well in giving us Spider Man's black costume and showed that you can pull in all these readers. Fans of Fantastic Four will come in and read Spider Man afterward because they were introduced here. And a lot of crossover ideas that had been built in the 1940s with the All Winners. Uh, as well as making the things that happen in the Secret Wars go into other comics. So if you were a Spider-Man fan and said, oh, I don't need to read these extra 12 issues, and then come back and see Spider-Man with a new outfit, you think, oh, well, maybe I should go back and buy these. And you can go to your local comic store and pick up back issues, and everybody makes a little bit more money. Spider-Man's black costume is going to become very important as we see a, a real struggle with darkness. We get into questions of with great power come great responsibility, but with enough power, you don't really have responsibilities anymore. You can do whatever you want, uh, and that's too far for Spider-Man, much as we saw in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies. But this will bridge very well into the next era we're going to call the Dark Age of Comics.